Welcome to our channel, Behind My Story. Please like, share, and subscribe. I am Matthew, 21 years old, and I must tell you something. I am a madman. I need treatment. But what kind of treatment is there for my kind of madness? You see before you a man with torn clothes who speaks to himself all the time. I used to be a doctor, but I left medicine to pursue aromacology. In case you were wondering, aromacology is the study of fragrances, such as scents of flowers and how they affect people. Let me tell you my story. My parents were very proud of me because I was intelligent, well-known, and well-respected at my university. I earned high marks in all my courses. Dad wanted me to join the College of Medicine because he had always dreamed of my becoming a doctor, and I felt that I couldn't deny him that. My parents did their best to make me happy and to help me achieve Dad's dream. But to be honest with you, medicine, engineering, the arts, none of these interested me at all. They weren't my dream. I loved flowers and their fragrances, like rose and honeysuckle. I would extract fragrances from them and give them as gifts to my friends and family. They all really enjoyed these aromatic gifts. My dilemma was that I had to find a way to tell Dad that I would rather study botany, plants, and aromacology, fragrances, over medicine any day. I knew he would think that I was crazy to give up the lofty study of medicine to work with flowers, but what can I say? I have loved flowers and fragrances ever since I was a youngster. I have always been fascinated by exotic flowers and scents. Learning how to make fragrances from flowers required me to meet with a lot of people who worked in this field. One day, I had to face the moment I had been dreading because my parents had arranged a large social gathering to celebrate my success at the university and my joining the College of Medicine. Dad asked me to tell everyone about my ambitions as a doctor. I suddenly knew that the moment had come when I needed to make my startling announcement to my parents. I told the audience I had decided that being a doctor was not for me and that I was going to change my field of study. Dad looked at me with an astonished look on his face, and then he began laughing. He thought I was joking. Then I turned to him and said, Dad, I'm not joking. I'm serious. I want to study flowers and fragrances, similar to the types of gifts I've given you before. The audience suddenly got very quiet. They could sense that this was an epiphany for my parents. The embarrassment and shock in the air was palpable. Dad looked at me and said with an affected smile, Matthew, you were born to be a doctor. Forget all this nonsense about silly flowers. A little testily, I said, Dad, extracting fragrances from flowers is not silly. Dad said, Bah, forget about that. The party spirit was somewhat subdued after this testy exchange. Regardless, in deference to Dad, I began studying medicine but most of my energy and attention was directed towards flowers and their fragrances. Sometimes I would spend time with my medical friends and sometimes with my aromacology friends that I had met earlier. I spent my first year in medical college earning high marks as usual, but I had no passion for it. It neither excited nor interested me. There came a day when I had had my fill of medical studies and just couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to leave the College of Medicine to pursue my true passion flowers and fragrances. When I told dad of my decision, he was very upset, cursing at me and accusing me of being mad, insane, crazy. I repeated that I had zero interest in medicine and stated that the true madness was sticking with a field that I really didn't like at all. I moved away from home and stayed with a friend for a while before finally renting and moving into a small apartment. I faced a lot of obstacles in the beginning, but I didn't give up. I set up an arboretum by planting some flowers and nurturing them. I was working on a rare kind of fragrance extracted from a variety of flowers. I had to travel to obtain these specimens. My product fragrances weren't successful at first, but I persisted. Initially, I offered my fragrance products to various factories, but all refused my offer. So I continued in my studies. I worked in many different places. In the evenings, I would spend all my free time doing my experiments. Over time, I grew more proficient in producing unique fragrances. Then one day, I received a phone call from a famous factory. The factory owner told me that he might be interested in working with me, so I sent him some samples of my work, and they delighted him. And I was delighted that he was delighted. 
Thus began the lucrative stage of my new endeavor. I started earning a decent income and achieved a modicum of success in the end. After a while, I called Dad and asked him to forgive me, and he did, finally realizing that my passions were not necessarily his passions and that I must pursue what I enjoyed the most. I have my own factory now. I achieved my dream in the end. My advice to you, the readers, is never to give up when pursuing your dreams. With persistence, you will be successful one day. So what do you think? Was I a madman to give up medicine for aromacology? Was I a madman to give up medicine for aromacology? Hi, my name is Patricia, and I'm 21 years old. I'm a working medical student who deals with patients, people who are sick, injured, or dying. In my field, one has to stay calm and act wisely when dealing with these matters. But there are cases where you need to be quick and on your feet. Such a situation happened to me once. I traveled to China with some other med students on a medical intern exchange. When we arrived, we were welcomed by the hospital staff, who were very professional, polite, and decent. During our on-the-job training, we dealt with various strange illnesses, but the hardest one of all was called the coronavirus. It spread from country to country, terrifying the whole world because it presented a severe threat to people's lives, especially older people, heavy smokers, and people with weak immunity systems. I was often conflicted between my survival instincts that were telling me to leave China and the oath that I took that compelled me to save people's lives instead of letting them die. My oath and sense of duty won out in the end, and I continued working at the hospital. The doctors and nurses wore surgical masks and gloves continuously due to the rapid influx of cases, which were increasing by the hour. My manager demanded more doctors and nurses to augment our staff as we were quickly becoming overwhelmed. The situation was dire, as were the World Health Organization statistics. One night, one of our nursing staff got infected, and soon after that, several doctors did as well. If we, health caregivers, were getting sick, then who would be left to tend to the patients? A few nights after, by chance, I overheard one of the staff talking on the phone. He was discussing a plot with another person on the other end. He wanted to sell used medical equipment as new ones to the other hospitals. No wonder nurses and doctors were getting infected. Their plot would spread the virus even faster by infecting the only people who could slow it down. What a vicious cycle! I went to the police station and told them about this heinous plot. They investigated and verified what I had told them. They then confiscated the contaminated masks and gloves. When they went to that person's office, he had already disappeared. Two days later, I found a letter on my desk. It was a threat that read, You will pay for what you did. But I was not intimidated, because my doctor's oath was to save lives, even at the risk of my own. Soccer is an obsession for people who like to bet, argue, and boast about whose team is best. My name is Jacqueline, and I'm 25 years old. I grew up in a family whose male members were crazy about soccer. They were fanatical fans of the Liverpool club team. We all knew the club had gone through some difficult seasons over the past few years, but it looked like they may have finally assembled a formidable team now. I, myself, wasn't interested in soccer, but Dad and my brothers were obsessed with it and would hit the ceiling whenever their team lost. I wished to live far away from all this, but at this point, it wasn't an option. After finishing high school, I went to an out-of-state college just to distance myself from all that hooting and hollering at home on game days. At college, I met someone. His name was Fred. We took the same classes and made an excellent team. Later on, he proposed, and I accepted. During college break, he visited so he could meet my family. It happened to be on a Liverpool soccer game day. That's when I learned that Fred was the same. In fact, he was even crazier than Dad and my brothers. It looked like he cared more about that team than anything else. It was the final match of the season. Everyone was excited about the game. I made a few bowls of popcorn for everyone to eat while watching the game. The two teams were about equally matched, and the score was tied. Suddenly, I heard angry shouts, so I went into the living room to see what had happened. The other team had scored a goal, and one of its players had fouled a Liverpool player. Then, they scored two more goals in quick succession. Fred lost it and began beating loudly on the coffee table. Then, he inexplicably lost consciousness and fell flat on his face. We took him to the hospital, 
where he spent three days in the intensive care. The doctor told us that he had had a heart attack, but he would be okay. After he recovered, he promised me that he wouldn't lose his temper over a soccer game again. Today, we are watching the final match between Liverpool and Tottenham. I have the ambulance phone number on speed dial, just in case. I adore my family. I adore our get-togethers, our joking around, our meals, everything. I can't imagine my life without them. But one day, I almost killed them all. No, I'm not insane, I assure you. So don't worry, I'll tell you what happened. My name is Ginger. I'm 18 years old. As you can see, I'm wearing an apron. This is because I love to cook. I like all things kitchen-related. My happiest moments are when I see my family eating a meal together. I always cook for them. They enjoy it too. And they support me. They let me try different dishes from different countries. I like to listen to their opinions about my cooking skills. I'm also addicted to cooking programs. One day, my cousin Charlotte came to visit before Thanksgiving Day. She likes to dress all in black. And today was no exception. For some reason, she had called me earlier and asked me if I had ever heard of the Thanksgiving Day curse. I said no, of course. So she told me that the curse applied to large families who ate a big meal together on Thanksgiving. The curse was the result of an evil spirit named Vicky who would possess the cook's body in some family's household and poison the whole family. She said that Vicky used to be a housewife who was a great cook and who loved her family. And yet she poisoned them all during Thanksgiving meal. She watched them die one by one, and then she killed herself as the grand finale. At first, I thought Charlotte was joking and trying to scare me, and I told her that it was nonsense, just an old wife's tale. But she said that every legend was usually based on facts. I paused for a second. That was partly true. I went to my room and searched the internet, and found the same information about the curse that she had relayed to me, which frightened me even more. Vicky was just like me. Or was it the opposite? I stopped myself from getting deeper into this. I needed to focus on preparing the meal. On Thanksgiving Day, my father bought some groceries, which included a white bottle of liquid. I presumed it to be milk, though it smelled a little weird. But I thought it was my imagination. My aunt called and said she would be arriving a few minutes later. So I had to hurry and finish the meal quickly. My finishing touch was dessert. It was going to be pumpkin candy. I prepared it using the milk that dad bought. After everyone had arrived, I served dinner. We all sat down and prayed before the meal. Then, everyone started eating. Things were going well. Everyone was chatting merrily and complimenting me on the food. I was overjoyed. But somehow, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong. I looked at Charlotte, but she smiled supportively. Suddenly, one by one, the people around the table started clutching their stomachs and groaning in pain. The last thing I remember before I lost consciousness was my brother calling the ambulance. When I woke up later, I was lying in a hospital bed, alongside all my family members, who were also lying in the hospital bed. The doctor came in and reported happily that we would all be fine. Then he looked at me and winked. He also said, Next time, young lady, I suggest not using white paint in your cooking. And that was how I almost killed my loving family.